This is a live recording of my podcast. Um, today, I really just wanted to recap what I've been doing, talk about what I consider to be season two of my podcast. And basically, in the last month, over 30 days, I did 25 podcast episodes. And that was what I considered um, really successful. I really wanted to, instead of focusing on memes for a little bit, to focus on making as much audio content as I possibly can. And what I ended up doing was almost every day for a month, I produced some kind of 10 to 20 minute lecture about whatever I thought was interesting. Um, that podcast is on my, in the link in my bio, it's on Spotify, Apple music, all of that. And I just wanted to go over what, that was and what I consider to be season two of the podcast. And I want this, what I'm recording right now, to be a kind of season three, like the introduction to season three of my podcast. Um, so basically in the last 25 episodes I did, I talked about, um, I really just went with it and I, I just talked about whatever was interesting that day, whatever I could talk about, whatever I can make, whatever on. Um, I made a lot of poetry analysis episodes because I love poetry. I've read a lot of poetry. Um, I did some like philosophy commentaries on Nietzsche and Freud and all of that. Um, I did a lot of art analysis and I even did one episode where I spent like 40 minutes breaking down the life of Pablo by Kanye West. So all of that I think went really well. Um, I wanted, my goal was one podcast every day. So I did miss that goal. I only made 25 in 30 days, but um, ultimately I'm pretty happy with how that went. Um, so some things that I don't think went very well was I didn't do as many interviews as I had wanted to do. I wanted to talk to more people. I did one interview with um, Isa Meeling. Um, she's a, sweet, a Swedish tattoo artist. We had a really great episode together. We're going to make another one together soon. Um, and I did one with an account called Haram Shit Posting, where we talked about Islamic and Catholic theology. Um, and it, I, I also didn't incorporate as much humor as I had wanted to in the podcast. It was more like very straightforward, very, um, very meticulously planned, very like, academic lectures. It, it wasn't as mimetic and funny as I wanted it to be. So I considered that to be um, kind of a miss. Um, and ultimately, I don't think that the podcast medium worked very well because I sh talked about art so much that the viewers couldn't really see the art I was analyzing, which was re really weird. Like you had to kind of search up the art online if you wanted to have any idea what I was talking about. So my plan for this season three is I, I don't think I'm going to attempt one podcast every day, but I'm going to do one piece of content every day. So I'm going to try to balance memes and podcasts more. I also think that not making memes really missed, um, missed the mark in promoting the podcast because when I wasn't producing memes, people weren't like viewing my account. And some people are commenting YouTube. That's like exactly what I'm going to get at. Um, I just set up a YouTube channel. Um, so I'm going to be making more memes to balance out the audio content versus the memes, which is just good for how I promote my content. I'm going to be producing YouTube videos. Um, I'm going to start filming and recording everything I produce and start cutting it together with like the paintings I'm talking about and the like lines of poetry I'm looking at. I'm going to go back and re-record some of the things I produced and just put it back into the, into the video format that it really should have been produced in to begin with. I want to do a lot more interviews. I only did three in total. One was also with Float Universe. Um, so I want to go, I want to really do a lot of interviews where you could see me talking to whoever I'm talking to. Uh, I want to set up a Patreon account because I don't like having um, – people don't like I, – I don't like having those weird, like, 
scripted advertisements at the start of my podcast. So I think it really throws off the whole tempo of everything. So I think I'm going to just set up a Patreon account. If you want to support the channel, you can, if not, whatever. And what I think I'm going to do is start talking to some artists. I've already been in contact with one artist that I'm a really big fan of. His name is Mark Lorenberg. And what I would like to do for whoever subscribes and donates on the Patreon channel, Patreon page, is maybe every month I can send them a piece of like merch or art or whatever. And I want to work with a different artist each month to do that. So I think that would be a really cool Patreon setup. I think that'd be good for promoting my channel, like getting some money and also making it worth like a worthwhile investment to anyone who is donating to me. They could get something really cool in return. I'm definitely going to continue my Bible series every Sunday. I'm going to make an episode later today about the today's Bible readings from for Catholic Church. And yeah, I also want to put together a survey and just post it on the link in my bio, get some of your feedback for everything I've been doing, like just just so you guys can let me know what you think and what you want to see more of. So that's really um really my plan. I have so much more content I planned. I really like brainstormed last night and I have so many podcast episodes and and YouTube video episodes that I want to make. So I'm nowhere close to running out of content to talk about, which is exciting. Um, I also just made a meme that I'm going to post in a little bit. So now this was just like a six minute update on what I've been doing. So now I guess I could just answer some questions. Um, one person said about, um, what I think about the Catholic church being so interested in money and power. Um, well, I think it's very interesting how this like Vatican city, Rome area of the world, just in general has always had so much power concentrated in it. That's certainly a, just a really interesting piece of world history. I think it makes sense that the Catholic Church wields so much money and power because there really was a war throughout Europe over history about what philosophical, educational, and religious point of views controlled the mindset of Europe and the culture. Ultimately, I think our world benefited a lot from the Catholic Church having so much power, just artistically and aesthetically. But Ultimately, I do think the Catholic Church is spectacularly corrupt and flawed. I don't think Pope Francis is as benevolent and benign as people think he is. Um, there's another question asking which form of Christianity I, I prefer. Um, I am raised Catholic, so I have a bias towards Catholicism. I tend to think that the best forms of Christianity are the more, most um, traditional I don't think there's anything wrong with deviating and being kind of a free thinker. But when you're approaching the idea of organized religion, I think you should look at it in its most traditional form and assess what you believe and don't believe from that traditional existence. I also think Catholicism preserved the metaphysics of Christianity, the more wonky, weird stuff, the more spiritual stuff in a way that Protestantism didn't. Um, so other, other questions, how far do I think I deviate from fundamentalism? I mean, that's, that's a hard question because I don't really know, um, you know, fundamentalism is hard to define, but I'd say, um, like on a scale of one to 10, how traditional is I get, I, I, how traditional Catholic I am. I give myself like a seven, like a light seven, um, Emily asked, what did I study at university? I'm just a business student. Um, I really should have been like an English language major or a psychology major, but I don't know. I did business so I could, you know, make money. Um, what religion do I admire most besides Christianity? I'm a big fan of Taoism. I've always been a fan of Taoism. I think as far as Eastern philosophy and religion goes, that's the closest analog to Christianity um, by its fundamental tenets. 
Um, how has Kanye affected my worldview? I love that question. Um, so there's this idea that I want to explore more in another episode. I, I did one episode that, that kind of touched on it, but I talked about how Nietzsche's fundamental criticism of Christianity was that it's like a religion that worships and idolizes weakness, that the fundamental virtue is like this meekness, this submissiveness. And Nietzsche thought it was this systematic suppression of a human's will to power. But what I think is so interesting about Kanye West, and I think this is very evident when you look at the way he's progressed throughout his life from his, his philosophy of egoism to his more psychologically conflicted music, like in, um, like in the life of Pablo to his kind of like his album. Yay really felt like he's so lost. I like, I think what's evident in his most recent music and his most recent interviews is that through this kind of faith in Christianity, this return, this, this devotion to Christianity, you really see him get a, a level of discipline and control over his life that allows him to be more prolific in his business, allow him to be more prolific in his art and music. And it really is interesting to see how that, you know, there's this, this quote from Jocko Willink, who's a really popular podcaster and Navy SEAL, that is discipline equals freedom. And it seems to me that Kanye is a really great example how discipline in Christianity led to his own freedom, uh, freedom from his own vices, freedom from his own addictions, um, freedom from his own mental illnesses, which he's so open about. Um, someone said, I look like Spider-Man from the plus the guy from There Will Be Blood. I don't know There Will Be Blood, but I've gotten that I look like Spider-Man a lot of times. So let's see any other questions. Um, The only way virtue exists in atheism is to spite or contradict the Christians and Christian opinion. Um, I don't, that, that line, I don't really, I don't really want to get into that right now. I don't I need to think about that. Has my faith in religion ever been significantly shaken? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was like not particularly religious in high school. I was going to a Catholic school and basically in that Catholic school, I was severely disinterested in what I was learning um, just because I was so surrounded by Christianity and it was being so forced on me that I was really disinterested, disengaged. I wanted more or less nothing to do with it. Um, I ended up, that's how I ended up reading da the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu which is a piece of Chinese philosophy um, that I became a big fan of. And then once I went to college and started, um, started getting really into philosophy, psychoanalysis, especially the Jungian stuff, is when I found my way back to Christianity and Catholicism. There's another question in the feed about why I am Christian. Um, I think that Christianity is a very coherent worldview, and I think that there's a lot of metaphysical truth to the Christian philosophy and religion that I found was very apparent in the use of say LSD and different things like that. Um, also the art of Catholicism is extremely, extremely psychologically resonant to me. And I think that's a statement of the underlying meta metaphysical truths of the philosophy is reflected in the art. And when it's especially resonant art, um, to me, that speaks to something about this, this level of truth in the, in the metaphysical groundwork of the religion. Okay. Would you say there's a fine line between spirituality and psychosis? Um, I wouldn't say it's a fine line at all. I'd say that there is a difference for sure. Um, and I'd say that a lot of people start off spiritual and enter this kind of psychosis. Um, but I don't think it's very obvious, you know, 
the definition of madness. I recently read Foucault's uh, Madness and Civilization. And, you know, Foucault kind of sucks in a lot of ways, but he also makes a lot of very interesting points. Um, and it's basically just an anth anthological book which discusses the history of madness and how we arrived at this definition of madness. And it's this idea that psychosis is this social construct in many ways. Um, I think there's validity to the idea and the diagnosis of psychosis, but the border at which spirituality becomes psychosis isn't clear. Um, and I think it really comes down to how much spirituality inhibits you from accomplishing your day-to-day -day goals. I think that's a good benchmark for um, what level of spirituality is healthy. You know, for, for say Kanye West, what I was talking about, his devotion to Christianity has given him a level of discipline recently that's really freed him from his psychosis. Whereas I think his spiritual egoism in his say Jesus years made him this kind of unhinged, reckless, addicted type figure that was addicted to everything um, and, and was just co com, like consumed by his own vices. And I think that's a example of spirituality moving into psychosis. Emily asked what kind of person I would be if um, be in 10 years or how I want to be in 10 years. Um, I want to be a pretty mundane person in 10 years. 10 years, I'd like to be like married, settled down, just like saving money, buying a house. Um, I see myself going into content marketing as a really um, good career path for me. I think I have a hypothesis that um, the entire biotechnology life and life sciences industry is doing marketing so catastrophically wrong because they aren't producing content in the way that they should. So in 10 years career wise, I see myself either working in a marketing agency, leading some kind of biotech division or owning my own marketing agency that specifically does content marketing for biotech companies. Um, in what way was Foucault wrong? Well, Foucault, Foucault basically takes this, these like social constructionist ideas and takes it to such a crazy degree where there is no human nature, which I think is a really weak argument. When you look at our shared evolutionary history, it becomes clear that many of these social constructs are the direct descendants of evolutionary, evolutionarily developed phenomena. Um, like for example, there's the whole like classic Jordan Peterson argument that hierarchies are innate to our psychology and people criticize that all the time. I think it's a very solid argument. Um, I did a podcast about it a few days ago, weeks ago, I don't remember, but if you go in to my, on my if you hit the link to my podcast, you'll find an episode, uh, Lobsters and DMT, the Jordan Peterson question. And that's when I go over that. And that's really an episode that talks about how, how Jordan Peterson's conversations about lobsters plays into the, um, plays into the social constructionist question and how I think it's a very solid re rebuttal to say, um, to, a so very solid rebuttal to, say, the Foucaultian postmodernist uh, writings. That being said, there's a lot of important points that Foucault makes about the social constructionist definition of madness, uh, etc. Um, I haven't. I've read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. That that's one of the questions. If I'm into Stoic philosophy, but I never really, really went into it and really analyzed it. Um, there's a question, do I see the recurrence of archetypal figures across several religions to be encouraging to belief in Christianity or discouraging? Um, many people who are faced with the archetypal recurrence of these Christian 
myths and mythologies as a very um, discouraging reality to the idea of Christianity and the truth of it. Um, I see their point, but I also see that Christianity is this story that evolved for an incredibly long period of time. And what I personally believe and think is, is a very strong case is that there was this figure, Jesus, this historical figure, um, and he lived this life and allegedly is the son of God. Um, he was certainly a real person, was claimed to be the son of God. His story was placed into this archetypal mythological framework that had existed in the West for an incredibly long period of time. And we now tell this story, which is a reflection of the mythological groundwork of our civilization. And that's just the way the story is structured. And then out of that story comes the question of, is Jesus the actual literal divine incar human incarnation of God? Um, that's an impossible question to answer, obviously, but I, um, I personally would say that I believe that. So yes, but ultimately the, um, the mythological groundwork of Christianity to me is encouraging rather than discouraging. Whereas I, I do know it's discouraging to a lot of people. Um, yes, to Jeffrey, Jerry Jackson, I'm definitely deep in the, the Jesus stuff for sure. Um, I'm just, I've actually been setting up, um, my room into a kind of studio. Let me show you. Um, I've repainted my walls and stuff. So, um, I'm planning on replacing this furniture and getting a piece of, um, shit. I'm planning on, can you guys hear me? Um, my connection is being shitty, but um, I plan on replacing that furniture, putting some art up, um, and I just put this stuff up on my desk, um, which is a, a piece by Gustave, Gustave Dore, um, which I think is really a really great piece of art. Um, See ya, Emily. But, so yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm excited to put this up on YouTube today. Um, I think the YouTube channel will, will do well. Did I give up anything for Lent? Um, my Lent move was to... Um, to really focus on doing the daily podcast because I had, I had really wanted to do a daily podcast for a very long period of time. Um, and I never really set aside the time and the discipline to do it. So I started my daily podcast on Ash Wednesday and that was my Lent promise. It wasn't really giving something up, although you could say I gave up, you know, I, I devoted a certain amount of time every day I gave up that time so I could produce this content and this logos that I had been wanting to produce so there's a question did Nietzsche's criticisms of Christianity to be valid um, in his last man argument um I think Nietzsche is definitely the best critic of Christianity of all time and my meme, the meme I'm going to post today is about Nietzsche. Um, I think it's valid in, in, I think it's a, it's a valid question to discuss and it certainly makes you think it makes you want like it, if Nietzsche is right. And Christianity really is a religion that worships and idolizes weakness and worships and idolizes the repression of our human self and instincts. Then that's a pretty damning criticism that makes 
Christianity fairly obsolete. And it's and even from a sociological point of view, it's no longer adaptive. It's it's this this maladaptive behavior pattern that our, our culture's foolishly adopting. But I on the grounds of Christianity making someone more weak is where I disagree with Nietzsche. And I think that that's, I think it's a, an argument to be made. And that's, that's why I keep going back to Kanye, because I think he's such a great example of, he was fundamentally weak when he was living out this Superman, Ubersmensch, Nietzschean self-worship, egoism, which wasn't, you know, he wasn't explicitly living out the Nietzschean idea, but he was rejecting traditional morality in order to be this avant-garde type figure. And I see that he's much stronger and more focused and effective in his art and business and music than he ever was. And yeah, Jesus, most someone, uh, someone commented, yeah, Jesus did use a whip of cords to punish those, uh, who made the temple into a market. And um, he definitely did that. And I, I love that story. And it's this, it's one of the more human moments in the, the gospels where you see the human aspect of Jesus. And I'm a big fan of that. Um, in my opinion, so, so is, uh, in my opinion, Kanye's top ego, uh, he made his best work, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, um, which um, I definitely like My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. I think I like The Life of Pablo better and Jesus better. Um, I actually think Kanye is getting better with time, but I also am referring to his competency as a um, – not just in the quality of his music, but also in the – volume of music he's been producing, um, the amount of money he's been making in his businesses. Um, and then also like, if you watch an interview with Kanye today and you see him talking about his plans for the future, he's no longer this unhinged delusional person. He has a very kind of coherent vision and he has this level of quiet confidence to him, which is very unique in the history of Kanye West. And I, I think that's very interesting. And I think that a lot of people who have creative impulses need to develop a level of a level of like slavery to one idea, one ideal. And I think that Christianity does a very good job of, of putting a person in this kind of framework that's very coherent and strong. Uh, there's the question, how do I feel about his backing of mega churches? Um, I'm a little disappointed in it. I've said a lot of times to, I don't think I've ever said it on the podcast or in my memes, but I've been saying this like a lot in my personal life that I'm getting very frustrated about everything being a business. Um, generally throughout my life, my political tendencies have been pro market, pro business, but I'm now becoming very skeptical of the idea of everything being a business. Like a church should not be a business. A, a, a university should not be a business. In a lot of ways, I don't think art should be monopolized by business. I think there needs to be, and this is a deviation from the point about churches, which I'm disappointed in, but I think we need as a society to look at ways where we can have art outside of the traditional market um, structure. Too many people use Christian Christ, use Christianity as moral insurance for their bad deals, deeds, and to fuel their own feelings of su superiority, fake Christians. Um, yeah, I, I think there's well, I think fundamentally in Protestantism, you have this null a lot of forms of Protestantism kind of nullify the whole point of sin 
and the whole point of believing in hell. Because if you believe in hell, you know, your actions are bound. There's certain things you can't do. But a lot of forms of Protestantism say that faith alone, that, that human sins are too great to be forgiven, that only through faith can a person go to heaven, which I think is a fundamentally backward step in Christianity that nullifies the whole point of having this philosophy of salvation. Um, and then in addition, you also have, say, Catholics and Catholic priests and people who do horrible things under the promise of, if I ask for forgiveness, I can still go to heaven, which is, um, which is a very big problem. I don't believe it's true that you can just ask for forgiveness because, you know, there's, there's the quote from Jesus that says, not all that utter Lord, Lord shall be saved. Meaning you have to, um, you can't just ask for forgiveness without truly being sorry and still be forgiven and saved. <sighs> the line between symbolism and actuality can get kind of blurry at times. I think that's definitely true. Um, for whatever reason, and I think this is the Jungian side of me coming out, I think at some level, everything we experience is symbolism. Everything we experience is placed in this archetypal framework within our psyche. And once that happens, once we perceive everything through the filter of our collective unconscious, you're not never really experiencing actual reality. You're experiencing this symbolic, psychological, archetypal hallucination at all times. Uh, I do believe in heaven and hell, to answer the next question. Yeah, it, I definitely believe in heaven and hell. Okay, any other questions? Papa Bear's Mooch says, what's up, ma'am? Um, and to anyone who's in the feed right now and don't know uh, about what I've been talking about. Um, I've been going over the past 25, I, I have been talking about my podcast. In the past 30 days, I did 25 episodes, which was a big accomplishment for me. I'm really happy about what I accomplished there. And I've just been going over what went well and what didn't go well. And my main point I'm getting at is that I'm going to be switching in addition to the podcast, which I'll still post on Spotify and Apple. I'm going to be focused on uh, a YouTube channel because I talk about a lot about, I talk so much about art and architecture and symbolism and paintings and everything like that, that it would very much help to put my content on YouTube. This way people viewing it can have, um, can know what they're looking at and know what I'm talking about. I also want to do a lot more interviews, which are very, um, YouTube's a great medium for interviews because you get to see the body language, you get to see the conversation, you get to see the people. So I'm considering this, what I'm recording right now, um, I'm filming it and I consider it to be episode one of season three of my podcast. There's the question, uh, what do you think about Jung stating that we should accept our shadows? The, the fundamental point that Jung makes in there is that by our human nature and by our evolutionary history and our precursors, um, we, we have things that we think about and are compelled to do that we don't like. And that's unacceptable given our social, um, given the society we live in and our moral system. And... I think that's a, a fundamentally important idea is to accept that because if you're so aggressively repressing it and refuse to see um, the shadow side of the person, then it'll come up without you even know that it's coming up.
Do I have any opinions on the virus being a hoax? I'm going to get, like, banned from YouTube if I give my opinion on this. Um, I think that we're seeing a lot of sketchy behavior from the World Health Organization, um, which doesn't surprise me because the World Health Organization is heavily influenced by the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I'm, I don't doubt at all that the coronavirus is that there are institutional narratives that are suppressing certain information about the coronavirus. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is a, a very respectable journal, uh, published an article saying that experts agree that it wasn't uh, genetically engineered, but they, that doesn't preclude that it leaked from a lab. Um, there, there are biosecurity level four labs in Wuhan, China, um, so it wouldn't be surprising to anyone really if um, if the coronavirus came from a lab. And I also think that if it was genetically engineered, there would be a concerted effort to make it clear that, to tell the public that it wasn't genetically engineered. And I think that time will tell how we look back at this um, this event, even if the coronavirus is not a bioweapon and was not genetically engineered. As a society, we're going to be much more afraid of bioweapons moving forward. We're, we're kind of waking up to our biological vulnerability the same way that in the past we woke up to the fact that we can build bombs that can eradicate the entire world if they're misused. We're now going to realize that we produce viruses and we experiment with genes in a way that can absolutely destroy and devastate our world. Uh, Amelia asked, does Jung refer to acceptance as acknowledgement or as cooperation? And uh, I think both, but he leans more towards cooperation. You need to acknowledge what parts of you are that shadow and once those shadow elements of your psyche are acknowledged then you can integrate them and understand the time to the appropriate time to use them um for example if you don't ever acknowledge um your violent tendencies you don't know when those tendencies are going to unconsciously influence you and you can't consciously decide when's the appropriate time to use them. You just lash out. So Jung kind of argues that you need to acknowledge and identify the shadow and then build it into, say, your conscious cognitive arsenal of problem solving. Uh, Papa Bear's Mooch says, what's your thoughts on 5G towers? Are they needed? Are they deadly? I, I've seen the, cons the, the theory is that the hypothesis that coronavirus is a kind of cell signaling phenomenon, that viruses in general come from cells being damaged and then cells communicating to other cells. Um, I have no reason to believe that that hypothesis as of right now. I don't I haven't seen any good evidence for it. It's an interesting hypothesis, but I don't have any reason to believe it. However, in general, there is good reason to think that 5G causes uh, causes can can damage people. That's you know, that's that study that's there's there's real evidence to that. And ultimately, I don't think that we need to be advancing cellular technology for faster internet in the way we're pushing to do it. I, I think it's generally unnecessary that that's a foolish game to keep playing this um, this year by year marginal improvement of cellular technology so we can just keep profiting. Um, yeah, I think it's unnecessary and I think it's a distraction from 
from better uses of technology, more important uses. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. What's more powerful, the persona or the shadow? I don't really know how to evaluate which one's more powerful. Um, but the persona is this idea that the you you project in a social setting is not the you that you appear to be to yourself. And I think that's a fine hypothesis. I think it's true. Um, yeah, I, I think that a persona is important. People shouldn't look at persona as a necessarily bad thing because a lot of people who I talk to, a lot of people that are, that are interested in this, this Instagram account and upcoming YouTube channel are people who like deep metaphysical concepts. But you also, even though you're tempted to, probably shouldn't start every conversation with every stranger with a discussion about how reality is an archetypal hallucination and etc. So the idea of a persona is you have a, a, a social face that you show that is presentable to society. And that's how you make the initial connections that become the friends that you explore deep metaphysical ideas with. So I think a persona is very important to develop, just like the shadow is very important to integrate. Um, I am getting tired, so I'm going to wrap this up, but this was, um, this was exciting. This was a great, um, I had fun recording this. I will probably produce another thing very soon. Um, I'll probably produce something on, um, YouTube tomorrow. I'll be posting this on YouTube in case for whatever reason you want to rewatch it or watch the whole thing or what have you. And I'll be posting a meme about Nietzsche in like probably as soon as I post this video on YouTube. So this was, <clears throat> this was very fun. Thank you all for listening. This was episode one of season three of the Logo Soup podcast. Thank you very much.